hello, my friends. Welcome back to another edition of The Doctor Is In. So today I'm going to be talking about state-sponsored slavery. There are many forms of slavery these days. Too many. Today, I'm going to discuss state-sponsored slavery. That is, slavery that is directly perpetrated by governments. I'll discuss a few egregious examples to illustrate the forms of this crime, and I'll also discuss some ways that governments are indirectly participating in these practices. I'll be referencing a lot of articles and reports, and all the links will be in the show notes. So first, a few definitions and explanations. A full definition of slavery can be found at the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. A simplified definition is, a slave can be defined as someone who is under the power of another who exercises the rights of ownership over them. This can take many forms from sexual exploitation to forced labor to organ trafficking. The enslaver's power can be manifested physically or psychologically and can be expressed in many different forms of exploitation. I'll take uh, some more definitions from the International Labor Organization, and they have written the Forced Labor Protocol, and it reaffirms the definition from the United Nations. And the following definitions and comments are all direct, direct quotes from the ILO. And so they have a definition that consists of three elements. It's work or service. It refers to all types of work incurring in any activity, industry, or sector, including the informal economy. Two, a menace of any penalty refers to a wide range of penalties used to compel someone to work. And the third element involves involuntariness. The terms offered voluntarily refer to the free and informed consent of a worker to take a job and his or her freedom to leave at any time. But this is not the case for an example when an, an employer or recruiter makes false promises so that a worker takes a job he or she would not otherwise have accepted. So referring to state slavery, the Abolition of Forced Labor Convention Number 105, adopted by the ILO in 1957, concerns the forced labor imposed, imposed by state authorities, and it prohibits specifically the use of forced labor. Uh, in several points. So one, as punishment for the expression of political views. Two, for the purposes of economic development. Three, as a means of labor discipline. Four, as a punishment for participation in strikes. And five, as a means of racial, religious, or other discrimination. So Article 2 of Convention Number 29 uh, describes five situations which constitutes exceptions to the forced labor definition under certain conditions. And so this is uh, exceptions to state-sponsored slavery, and that is one, compulsory military service, two, normal civic obligations, three, prison labor under certain conditions, four, work in emergency situations such as war, calamity, or threatened calamity, fire, flood, famine, earthquake, etc., uh, and five minor communal services within the community. And so what's the difference between forced labor, slavery, and substandard working conditions? Well, forced labor is different from substandard or exploitative working conditions. Various indicators can be used to ascertain when a situation amounts to forced labor, such as restrictions on workers' freedom of movement, withholding of wages or identity documents, physical or sexual violence, threats and intimidation, or fraudulent debt from which workers cannot escape. But there's but a lot of what we're talking about here, forced labor, this is sponsored by the state, state-sponsored slavery, and uh, that can be equated with human trafficking. So let's go on to our first uh, example. It's the country of China. Yes, surprise, surprise. So the 2020 U.S. State Department tip report, that's trafficking in persons report, states that China ha has, as a has a government policy and pattern of widespread forced labor, including through the continued mass arbitrary det detention of more than 1 million Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs, ethnic Kyrgyz, and other Muslims in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is Xinjiang. Authorities also expanded the campaign into other provinces and began implementing it among other religious minorities and sought the coerced repatriation and internment of religious and ethnic minorities living abroad. 
It has been documented for quite a few years now that Chinese government actively enslaves people, particularly religious and particularly Muslim minorities in the western part of the country. The reports are astounding and amount to what's been called genocide through forced labor, mass detention, forced abortion, and forced sterilization. The TIP report makes it clear that China refuses to report on inv investigations of human trafficking, probably because there aren't any investigations or so few as to make a difference, and they haven't done this for several years. China also conflates and obfuscates human trafficking with other crimes of abuse, violence, smuggling, labor contract violations, and other issues. This makes it impossible to track progress or regression in addressing these crimes. So basically, the Chinese government fails to acknowledge trafficking within its borders at all, which is a bit like condoning it. Basically, according to the report, there was an overall decrease in all activities related to prosecution, protection, and prevention of human trafficking. It's as if they don't even care to put on theater about trying anymore. The tip report goes on. The state-sponsored forced labor is increasingly prevalent in China. In 2013, the National People's Congress ratified a decision to abolish, quote, re-education through labor, a punitive system that sub subjected individuals to extrajudicial detention involving forced labor, from which the government reportedly profited. The government closed most re-education through labor, or RTL, facilities by October 2015. However, the government reportedly converted some RTL facilities into state-sponsored drug rehabilitation facilities or administrative detention centers where, according to civil society and media reports, forced labor continues. State-sponsored forced labor is intensifying under the government's mass detention and political indoctrination campaign against Muslim minorities in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Authorities have utilized discriminatory surveillance technology and arbitrary administrative and criminal, criminal provisions to detain more than one million ethnic Muslims, including Uyghurs, ethnic Hui, ethnic Kazakhs, and ethnic Kyrgyz, as many as 1,200 vocational training centers or internment camps d designed to erase ethnic and religious identities. Camp authorities reportedly forced some in individuals to work in staff positions within the camps, including in Mandarin language instruction. Following, quote, graduation from these facilities, the government subjects many of these individuals to forced labor in adjacent or off-site factories producing garments, carpets, electronics, bedding, hair products, cleaning supplies, and other goods for domestic and international distribution. Coercive conditions reportedly include threats of physical violence, forcible drug intake, physical and sexual abuse, and torture. Local governments have reportedly used the threat of internment to coerce some members of these communities directly into forced labor. Authorities offer subsidies incentivizing Chinese companies to open factories in close proximity to the internment camps and to receive transferred detainees at satellite manufacturing sites in other provinces. Local governments receive additional funds for each inmate forced to work in these sites at a fraction of minimum wage or without any compensation. The government has transported tens of thousands of these individuals to other areas within Xinjiang and to other provinces or forced labor under the guise of poverty alleviation and industrial aid programs. Authorities in some localities also subject the families of men arbitrarily detained in Xinjiang to forced labor in their absence. Contacts report families separated by the system are more likely to fall below the poverty line and are therefore at higher risk of sex trafficking and forced labor. Authorities are increasingly placing the young children of interned Muslims in Xinjiang in state-run boarding schools, orphanages, and, quote, child welfare guidance centers, end quote, and forcing them to participate in political indoctrination activities and report on their families' religious activities. Authorities reportedly place older children among these groups in vocational schools, where some may be victims of forced labor. Some Kazakhstani and Kyrgyzstani citizens are arbitrarily detained while visiting family in Xinjiang. Their children, now unaccompanied abroad, are also at elevated risk of trafficking. 
There are forced, there are reports of forced marriages of ethnic minority women with Han men under the government's discriminatory ethnic assimilation policies, placing them at higher risk of forced labor in domestic service and other forms of exploitation. The Xinjiang Production and Construction Corporation, Bing Tuan, an economic and paramilitary organization with administrative control over several areas in the region. According to NGO reports, Bing Tuang, regiments man- manage at least 36 agricultural prison farms throughout Xinjiang. Unlike the aforementioned mass detention campaign, this system primarily subjects ethnic Han Chinese inmates, many of whom may be victims of arbitrary detention, to forced labor. Inmates are also subject to forced labor, building new prison facilities, or work in coal and asbestos mining. So Han Chinese is a majority ethnic group in China. When you think Chinese, that's Chinese. They're Han. So Uyghur adults and children are reportedly forced to pick cotton under direction of the Bing Tuan. The impact of formal discriminatory employment policies barring Uyghurs from jobs in many other sectors, including the annual cotton harvest, reportedly drives thousands of Uyghur farmers out of their communities in search of alternative work placing them at higher risk of forced labor. Tibetans are also vulnerable to arbitrary detention, featuring similar political indoctrination and forced prison labor practices in the Tibet Autonomous Region and neighboring provinces. Authorities also reportedly subject some Buddhist clerics to political indoctrination activities and forced labor in monasteries repurposed as factories. The government's forced urban resettlement programs reportedly require Tibetans to bear a large portion of resettlement costs, placing many of them in debt and consequently at higher risk of forced labor. Christians and members of other religious groups are also subjected to forced labor as part of detention for the purpose of ideological indoctrination. Survivors report having been forced to work in brick kilns, food processing centers, and factories manufacturing clothing and housewares. Law enforcement officials detain some People's Republic of China, national and foreign women on prostitution charges without due process in custody and education centers, where they subjected to forced labor. Uh, by the way, uh, prostitution is not legal, although there's millions, estimated 6 to 8 million uh, women working in prostitution in China. And so international media report, uh, local authorities force children in some government-supported work-study programs to work in factories. Some school districts compel students into forced labor and manufacturing under the guise of mandatory internships. So, I mean, we've seen, yes, they're targeting minorities and they're targeting uh, prisoners, prostitutes, but, you know, these can also include the ethnic Han, the majority Han people. And so, as I'll get to in a moment, China also allows North Korea to participate in their own state-sponsored slavery in China. So, the North Korean government subjects North Korean citizens to forced labor in China as part of its proliferation finance system, likely with the knowledge of PRC, or People's Republic of China, officials. This includes forced labor in hotels, restaurants, and in remote cyber operations. So the latest scandal to break in China is that many of the world's solar panels and the raw materials to build them come from slave labor in Xinjiang, China. Environmentalist Michael Schellenberger has been writing about this issue, and he reports that the four largest solar panel makers all source polysilicon from the Muslim region and are therefore implicated in having tainted supply chains. Finally, The Biden administration has acknowledged this fact, but has not yet decided how to handle the conflicting issues of needing cheap solar panel and not participating in slavery and genocide. Hmm. I'm not really clear what the big conflict is. Life, freedom, doing the right things, protecting innocent people, or money. Hmm. Go figure. So, and I haven't even started talking about China's state-sponsored organ harvesting scheme, but I will certainly get to that in a future podcast with a special guest. I'm just trying to line up a time when we can talk. But really, what I've just talked about in China is just scratching the surface, but you get the idea. There are things we can do. 
uh, we can stay up to date. You can follow organizations like the Coalition to End Forced Labor in the Uyghur region. And that's a coalition of civil society organizations and trade uni unions united to end state-sponsored forced labor and other egregious human rights abuses against people from their Uyghur region in China. So, and this coalition is calling on leading brands and retailers to ensure that they are not supporting or benefiting from the pervasive and extensive forced labor of the Uyghur population and other Turkic and Muslim-majority peoples perpetrated by the Chinese government. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute has published a report, quote, Uyghurs for Sale, in early 2020, which states that at least 83, at least 83 household name brands are potentially directly or indirectly benefiting from the use of Uyghur workers outside Xinjiang through abusive labor transfer programs. So it's not just within the Xinjiang region, but the Uyghurs and other Muslim peoples are being transported through other parts of China. Also, my friends at Be Slavery Free have been instrumental in developing and ensuring passage of Australia's Modern Slavery Act. And they have a current campaign to amend the, the Australian customs law to ban goods produced by Uyghur slave labor. The USA and other countries have similar laws, but as long as our governments maintain backbones to enforce the laws. So now we go to North Korea. We go from a very horrible, terrible, no good situation in China to North Korea, where it is multiple times worse. I think all the people there might be qualified as some sort of slave because there is no such thing as private property there. And according to the government, um, although black markets do exist, uh, they're really all property is belongs to the government and is property of the state. And they are certainly treated like that. There's no freedom for anyone in the country, and one survivor has said that the whole country is a concentration camp. So I'm going to read a couple of few paragraphs. If the next few paragraphs are a mashup of an article in Human Trafficking Research and a Reuters article, and both are from 2018. I couldn't find anything uh, more recent that was as comprehensive as, as these reports. So the Global Slavery Index reports that over 1 million North Koreans are estimated to be in modern-day slavery. Of those, approximately 100,000 to 200,000 work internationally, performing slave labor, labor, labor for the Kim regime. In compensation for their stressful manual labor, workers receive approximately only 10 to 20 percent of their wages. North Korea is believed to generate up to $2.3 billion by some estimates. And I have read that this number is might be only in the $500 million to $1 billion range, um, but who knows? Anyway, it's millions and millions to a billions of dollars through this exploitative practice. And this income serves to circumvent the economic isolation stemming from North Korea's nuclear program and provides the regime with a cash, cash flow to sustain itself. Michael Glendinning of the European Alliance for Human Rights in North Korea said Pyongyang was in full control and benefiting hugely from this program. To prevent def defection, workers are heavily vetted prior to international placement. Glendinning explains that they only select workers who are married and have children, and that's basically hostage taking. And so, because if they were to defect, the family would likely face some kind of punishment in a political prison camp, a re-education camp, or in extreme cases, execution. North Korea has exported forced labor for decades, but the practice has increased under Kim Jong-un, who came into power in 2012. It's estimated that North Korean workers are employed in 45 countries throughout Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, working primarily in construction, mining, logging, and textiles. The laborers endure long hours, poor conditions, and constant, though sometimes covert, oversight from government authorities. North Korean workers are known to have died from working conditions in Russia, Poland, Qatar, among others. Russia and China are home to the most North Korean workers. In China, North Korean workers labor in factories, process seafood, and fill labor gaps. 
An Associated Press investigation in 2017 found that seafood processed by North Korean slave labor was distributed in U.S. markets despite federal law prohibiting this practice. The European Union has also been a destination for North Korea's unique brand of modern-day slavery. The Wall Street Journal reports that for decades, North Koreans worked in Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Malta, Poland, and other nations. However, changes in EU policy and international sanctions have mostly ended the practice. We'll see, right? Poland uh, supposedly is one of the last states to end its use of North Korean labor, although workers could remain until their visas expire. And it's noted that in Polish shipyards, North Korean laborers worked on warships belonging to NATO members. So while North Korean workers are victims of modern-day slavery, exploited and poorly treated in international postings around the world, they're often better in they're often in better conditions and receive better pay than their fellow, fellow citizens at home. But North Koreans do not have proper contracts or pay slips. They must surrender their passports and face restrictions in their movements. They are also kept under surveillance and have to participate in ideological study sessions. What we're seeing is a mini Pyongyang being exported. They are literally sending their human rights abuses to the EU and we're tolerating it, said Glenn Dinning. So the following paragraphs are excerpts from a 2017 AP article which describes the working and living conditions of North Koreans at facilities in China. In an effort to boost the local economy, China and North Korea agreed several years ago to allow factories to contract for groups of North Korean workers, establishing an industrial zone with bargain priced labor. Since then, dozens of fish processing companies have opened in Hunchun, China, along with other manufacturers. Using North Korean workers is legal in China and not considered forced labor. How convenient. It's unknown what conditions are like in all the factories in the region, but AP reporters saw North Koreans living and working in several of the Hunchun facilities under the watchful eye of their overseers. The workers are not allowed to speak to reporters. However, the AP identified them as North Korean in numerous ways. The report, the portraits of North Korea's late leaders that they have in their rooms, their distinctive accents, interviews with multiple Hunchun business people. The AP also reviewed North Korean labor documents, including copies of a North Korean passport, a Chinese work permit, and a contract with a Hunchun company. When a reporter approached a group of North Koreans, women in tight, bright polyester clothes preparing their food at a Hunchun garment factory, one confirmed that she and some others were from Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. Then a minder arrived, ordering the workers to be silent. Don't talk to him. Their contracts are typically two or three years, and they are not allowed to go home early. The restrictions they work under make them very valuable employees. North Korean laborers are more stable than Chinese workers, said Li Xiaxia, a sales manager at Yanbian, Shanghai Industry and Trade Company, a major Hunchen seafood processor. Chinese workers have job protections that give them the right to take time off, while North Korean workers complete their contracts with few complaints rare sick days, and almost no turnover. They won't take a leave for some personal reason, said Lee, whose company shipped containers of squid and snow crab to the U.S. and Canada in July and August. They are also considered cheaper. Lee said that at the Yanbian Shanghai factory, the North Korean salary is the same as for the Chinese, roughly $300 to $385 per month. But others say North Koreans are routinely paid about $300 a month compared to up to $540 for Chinese. But either way, the North Korean government of Kim Jong-un keeps anywhere from half to 70% of their pay, according to scholars who have surveyed former laborers. It passes on to the workers as little as $90 per month, or roughly 46 cents per hour. 46 cents per hour. The work can be exhausting, with shifts lasting up to 12 hours and most workers getting just one day off a week. At some factories, laborers work hunched over tables as North Korean political slogans are blasted from waist-high loudspeakers. Although AP saw North Korean workers at Hunchung, Donyang, manager Xu Qichen said that they don't hire North Korean workers anymore and refuse to give details. The other Chinese companies didn't respond to repeated quests for comment. Shipping records 
seen by the AP show that more than 100 cargo containers of seafood, more than 2,000 tons, were sent to the U.S. and Canada this year from the factories where North Koreans were working in China. So, I mean, I just state that because it's the our it's coming from slave labor in China. It's clear. It's been documented. But back to the back to the workers and why they're going and you know, do they have a choice to go or are they forced to go? And so the AP states that if a North Korean wants to go overseas, China is his or her least favorable option. So they have options, I guess, if they want to leave North Korea. Um, and because in China, the factories have essentially prison-like conditions. And so if you're going to go to Russia or uh, Poland, then it's better than China. And the vast majority of workers of the in Hunchun are women in their 20s. Most are thought to be hired back home by labor brokers who often demand bribes for overseas jobs. The laborers arrive in China already divided into work teams, each led by a North Korean overseer and remain isolated even from their own employers. They are not allowed to mingle with the Chinese, said a senior manager at Hunchun Company that employs many North Koreans. He spoke on condition that he not be identified, fearing repercussions on his business. We can only communicate with their team leaders. In a sense, the North Korean workers in China remain in North Korea under constant surveillance. They only talk about what they need to, said a medical worker who confirmed their nationality and had cared for some, and also spoke on condition of anonymity, anonymity out of concern for angering Chinese authorities. They don't talk about what they might be thinking. They live crowded into rooms often above or next door to the factories in a world awash in North Korean rituals. But despite the pay and restrictions, these are highly sought after jobs in North Korea. I mean, that tells you a lot. I mean, that it's a chance to move up a rickety economic ladder and see a bit of the world beyond the closed in nation. And actually, the article states that there are benefits to working overseas because their monthly earnings, despite only making 10 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar, uh, their earnings in China far more than many would earn in North Korea today, where official salaries often equal $1 per month. Experts estimate most families live on about $40 to $60 a month, with much of their earnings coming from trading. So, and there are, and there are benefits to working overseas. Their monthly earnings in China are far more than they would earn in North Korea today, where official salaries are often equal to one or two dollars per month. When the I think the UN's poverty poverty line is just one dollar ninety a day. So Lim Il, a North Korean refugee, says he bribed a series of officials with twenty bottles of liquor, thirty packs of cigarettes, and restaurant gift cards to get a job at a, as a construction worker in Kuwait City in the late 1990s when North Korea was still suffering through horrible famine. I felt like I had won the lottery, he said. People fantasized about getting overseas labor jobs. Lim, a man in his late 40s who fled to South Korea in 1997 and now writes novels about the North, said that even though he was never paid his $120 a month salary, he was happy to sim- simply get beef soup and rice every day. Wow. He says, unless you were an idiot, you wouldn't give up such an opportunity, he said. While he never thought of himself as a slave, looking back, he says that is the right description. These North Korean workers today still don't know that they are slaves. That's sad. That is, they don't even know what freedom is. How sad is that? So there is a new law in the United States that labels all North Korean workers, both overseas and inside the country, as engaging in forced labors. There are not many countries that, at a government level, export their own citizens as a commodity to be exploited, said an anonymous official at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, who spoke on condition of anonymity because he wasn't authorized to speak to the media. This is state slavery through and through. This is the result of a terrifying, oppressive, totalitarian regime. For a more detailed and personal picture of what it's like to grow up in North Korea, you must watch or listen to Jordan Peterson's recent interview with Yeonmi Park. It is shocking and stunning. It's amazing. You must go and uh, listen to that right after this. But there are other forms of state-sponsored labor 
and there are situations where the state government themselves are not participating directly in forced labor or slavery, but the national laws are such that practices are allowed and seemingly condoned. The following are a few examples. So labor laws and rights in countries like Uzbekistan, where one in eight people of working age participate in the cotton harvest, make systemic forced labor and exploitative labor and child labor possible. But fortunately, according to the ILO, the country is reforming labor laws and is making significant progress in reducing exploitation and dubious recruitment practices. Another example is the kafala system in Gulf Corporation Council or GCC countries as well as Jordan and Lebanon. The ILO, or International Labor Organization, I quote, Under kafala, a migrant worker's immigration and legal residency status is tied to an individual sponsor through his or her contract period in such a way that the migrant worker cannot typically enter the country, resign from a job, transfer employment, nor leave the country without first obtaining explicit permission from his or her employer. And that goes for blue-collar as well as white-collar workers. This is distinct from most other sponsorship regimes, where only the migrant worker's employment status is determined by the employer at the time of entering the country, and where there is more flexibility in being able to switch employers without losing immigration status. The article goes on, Modern functioning of kafala is inherently ripe with opportunities for employers to violate the fundamental human rights of the migrant workers under their sponsorship. Through kafala, migrant workers are placed in a position of vulnerability and have very little leverage to negotiate with employers given the significant power imbalance embedded within the employment relationship. Common grievances expressed by migrant workers include restrictions on free movement, confiscation of passports, delayed or non-payment of salaries, long working hours, untreated medical needs, and violence all conditions that can give rise to situations of forced labor and human trafficking. Again, this is not the state directly perpetrating slavery, but allowing it and overlooking the practice through the continued support for the law. The situation of these migrant workers has come into international light when it was discovered, already years ago, that Qatar has been abusing its foreign workers in the construction of the 2022 FIFA World Cup facilities. I've written and posted numerous times about this and post some links, but you can scroll back and look. Some of the countries, such as Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, have started to reform their kafala system, and that is bringing hope that systemic change for human rights can happen in these countries. There's flagrant ignoring of abuses by other countries, and this is being perpetrated by pretty much every nation on the planet in some form of another. You know, take the example of the solar panel issue I described above. Look at all the companies sourcing cheap goods from slave labor camps, from India to Bangladesh to China to everywhere, and they're getting away with it because our governments let them get away with it. And I really wish that there was more I can do. And I know that there's, you wish you could do more about it too, but we have to be we have to be aware. We have to share these stories. We have to be aware of the tea campaigns or chocolate campaigns or cotton campaigns or, or fish campaigns or, or whatever, whatever, whatever campaign is interesting you. Understand the issue. Know how to work with your politicians. Let your companies know that you won't stand for this. Buy something else. Take your dollars elsewhere. As William Wilberforce has said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. And so I thank you for listening to another episode. Again, all the links will be below. Uh, do stay tuned. I'm looking forward to seeing you in a live webinar. And I thank you for tuning in to all the future podcasts I'm posting. Have a wonderful day. Get outside, make some vitamin D, and we'll see you next time the doctor is in. 